Lord changes life. Whatever. Yeah, Rick, whatever. <laughs> yeah, the Lord just changes your life. That's the key to it. That's the key to it. He's the forgiver. And he changes our life and changes our outlook on life and changes the direction and the destinies of our life. You know, I, I, just to speak of one tiny little phrase about destiny here, because the word is used quite often. And for people who really like the strict definition of destiny, it would be that we are destined for something that cannot be changed or altered. And that's when you use the word destiny, some people think, okay, that means that we have some prescribed point we're going to arrive out in the future regardless of what happens in our life. But when Christians use the word destiny, we most often mean um, the point out there in the future where our choices bring us. And that it is, it, is not, it is not luck, it's not being born under the right star, it's not having the right uh, astrological charts and so forth. It is the, the choices that we make that determine our destiny. And that we will arrive somewhere out there in the future based on uh, the choices that we make in this life and the directions that they take us. And, and I believe that is a godly look or thought about destiny. So when we say destiny in the church, we're talking about something that can be altered based on you making wise choices. And uh, so we thank the Lord for that. And, and the forgiver is the one who gives us that opportunity to, to start over again, right? Yeah, to be saved, to be washed, to be clean, to start over again. I'm so glad that the Lord gave me the chance to start over again. Aren't you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, and I used to say, he's the God of the second chance. I used to preach that. God, he's the God of the second chance. Until I moved past the second one. And uh, now I just say, he's the God of another chance. <laughs> Glory to God. Yeah, he's, he's far more than two. I'm serious. And uh, we all know that. And we know what the Lord's doing in our life. Uh, I want to share with you today... Uh, a concept that, that uh, is one of the mainstays, I guess, of my life as I've gone through the years and preaching and trying to share with people. There are certain messages that you preach that, um, you know, when you're finished, when you get finished preaching that, you just, you're so relieved because it just didn't really, it didn't come out like you wanted it to. And you're thinking, man, that, I, I don't think I'll ever do that again, you know. But then there are some messages that the Lord uses, and, and, um, and, and just no matter, uh, whenever you might preach that message, uh, God just seems to bless it because it's just such a universal truth about all of our lives, and all of us have had opportunities where uh, what, what I'm dealing with today, and many of you have got your notes, and you're looking at it, and I'm talking about drifting today, and, and that, that this is such a, an easy thing to do in life. And, and it's, it's so vital that we not allow this to happen in our life. And it happens so easily and quickly. We don't even have to try for this to happen that uh, I think an occasional warning from, from God about it would, uh, would, be, would be good for us. Have you ever been out uh, on a floaty or a raft out in the, uh, the, down on the beach? Or if you've ever been out in a little boat, you know, fishing? Well, it doesn't have to necessarily be a little one. It could be a big one. But you've been out fishing, and, and you started out like over here, and, bef and, and then maybe a few minutes later or an hour later, however long, you, you, you wake up and you find out you're way over here. Uh, what happened? Uh, you drifted, right? Yeah, sure you did. Yeah, and it happens so easily and so subtly that you don't really even notice that, that you're drifting. And the reason I ask you this is because uh, I have found that there are many people, even Christians, who basically live their life that way. That their life is just basically drifting out of control. Now, some people know that they're drifting. And I've talked to people before that said things like this, Pastor, I need you to pray for me. Because, you know, there was a time when, when, when coming to church meant something to me. I mean, I enjoyed it. I looked forward to coming to church. The Word of God was, I love to hear people preach the Word of God, and I would read my Bible at home. And, 
and I would be at prayer meeting and I would want to pray and I would believe in prayer and I'd stand down in the front of the church and boy, believing that prayer was going to, and there was just a real warmth toward the things of God in my life. But now, now I'm just cold. I mean, I, I, I've lost my motivation. I've, I've lost my heart. And I just, I just wonder, is there any chance that I might be able to get that back again? Is there any chance that, that I might be able to, to be like I used to be and have a hot heart for God? Pray for me, Pastor. Pray for me. Well, you've drifted so far that now you've come to the point where you rec recognize it. And it's gotten so bad that, you, that you've noticed it and you say, I've just... I'm, I'm, I'm just, can I be back again? So there are some people who realize they're drifting. And sadly and unfortunately, there are others who don't realize what shape they're in and how much danger they're in. These are people who are thinking something like this. Uh, well, it's true, it's true. I, I, know, I know I'm not where I, I used to be, and I know I'm, I'm not... You know, I'm not, I'm not like I, I was at one time, but, I, but I'm okay. I'm, I'm doing okay. I'm, I, I'm doing all right. Uh, I'm just real busy, you know. You know, just so busy. I just have so much. And, but, but I'll be fine in life. Uh, my life's not falling apart, really. And, and my kids are only, you know, kind of semi-falling apart. And, and, uh, but that's okay. That's no big deal. No big deal. But may I say to you this morning, and I, I'm, I really want to be kind about this, uh, it is a big deal. It is a big deal because the process that you are in is a process that if it's not stopped, you have cut loose from your anchors, you cut loose from your, from your moorings, and you're, and you're drifting. And if that drifting is not stopped, I'll tell you where it's going to end. It's going to end in destruction. And I'm, and I'm not trying to be overly dramatic about it. Uh, it's going to end with, with relationships that you've had that used to excite you and you used to thrive on. Uh, they're going to be non-existent. You're going to be disillusioned, disappointed. Your heart's going to become harder and harder. That sense of the presence of God that, that used to warm you a little bit, you know, and even if, you, even if things weren't all that, uh, we used to use the term, old term, hunky-dory. Has anybody ever heard that one? Even if everything's not so hunky-dory in your life, uh, you still had that sense of, of God's presence being there, and it kind of gave you a, a real warmth in life, well, that's going to be non-existent non -existent as, as you try to explain to God how you don't have enough time anymore. So it's time to stop deceiving ourselves. If we're drifting and if, if, we're, if we're out of control, we're in a dangerous point in life. It's like I, I, I read um, several years ago about the Niagara River. I've never been to the Niagara Falls. Maybe some of you have, but I've never been there. I'd love to go there one day. And uh, if I don't get there this side of heaven, I think in the millennium, I'll just visit the Niagara Falls. But anyway, the Niagara River obviously feeds Niagara Falls, and it's a giant river, and it's about a mile wide. It's the widest point in it. And then as it, as it approaches the falls, obviously the, uh, the, 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 the ba basin of the river begins to, to go down very quickly and sharply, and the water begins to move really fast. Well, at that point where the river turns down and the water begins to run fast, there are signs on each side of the river. And it says, uh, beyond redemption point. In other words, if you allow yourself to drift into that section of the river, uh, you're not coming back because the water moves too fast, it's too quick, and you have moved past the point where um, a motor a rescue team, or anything is going to be able to catch you before you go over that falls. Well, 
how many of you agree that it's, it's really easy to drift? And the reason that it is so easy to drift is because we live in a world that's hostile to the things of God. Uh, we live in a world that is constantly pushing us away from God. We live in a world that's constantly uh, rattling us and, and moving us toward drifting in life. And it could be lots of reasons for this. It could be where you work. It could be the people you work with. It could be your family. It could be a, a friend. It could be school. I mean, there could be lots of, of things that are used to push you away. But we all live with with, with a pressure that seems to push us away from the things of God. And that's why it's so vitally important that, that we develop an adequate defense so that if we find ourselves moving away from God and pushing away from God, that we can, that we can establish some, uh, uh, some strategies so that we might push back against the push of the world that pushes us away from the things of God. I mean, as I mentioned at the beginning, you don't even have to try to drift. The world is just going to push you that way. Every day, every minute of the day, every opportunity, every possibility, you're going to be pushed toward drifting in life. So today what I want us to do is I have one principle to share with you. And then I have three strategies on how to accomplish that, that one principle so that when we finish today, we can at least have an opportunity to say, I, I, I can stop. And, and there's a good, and if, and if I obey God and I, and I obey what the word says, that there's a good chance that six months from now, I won't be back in this same place again. That I can develop a life that's just not a series of mountaintops followed by drifting. I, I don't think God intends for our life to be mountaintops followed by drifting. And that somehow we would just drift from one, one peak and one exciting you know, reality with God and some, something that stirs us and then we get on a mountaintop and then before you know it, we're drifting uh, until we get to the next mountaintop. That God intends for us to have a life that is stable and pointed in the right direction and moving in the right direction and is going in a direction that's ordered by him, not just simply drifting out here helter-skelter to, where we, where, to anywhere in life. Now, I'm going to read three verses out of the book of Hebrews. And before I read them, I want to give you just a little context so that these verses hopefully will mean something to you when I read them to you. Because the book of Hebrews, we, we're not, when I say we, I'm talking about theologians and experts in, in, um, in studying the scripture. They're not really sure uh, who wrote the book of Hebrews. And I know that doesn't come as any surprise to you Bible students. But um, the, book is, the book was written, and, and many of the scholars believe it was written by the Apostle Paul. Uh, it doesn't really matter, I, I, really, because the Holy Spirit is the one who gave the word and, and, gave, and gave what the book is about, and I do believe that totally about every bit of the word of God, inspired by the Holy Spirit, pinned down by men who were led by the Holy Spirit. It's what the Bible says about it. But, but even though we don't know who wrote the book for sure, we do know why. And the reason the book was written was because Back in, in the early church, uh, many of the believers that came to Christ were Jewish believers. Well, these Jewish believers belonged to the temple, and they, their life revolved around the temple. And so when they would trust Christ, uh, they would give their heart to the Lord, and they would go to a Christian gathering and begin a, a Christian work. This church would be made up, for the most part, of Jewish believers who had received Christ as their Messiah, had given their heart to the Lord, had realized that Judaism feeds into Christianity because for thousands of years God has used the temple and everything about it and all the customs, all the holy days, feast days, high priests, all of those things were just, were just uh, shadows of what, what he was going to do when Christ came. 
And they realize that and they come to Christ. Well, down at the temple, what would happen is when the Jewish believers would go to Christ, uh, they would just treat them terribly. Uh, they would basically, uh, and I know this may sound strange, but they would just count you as dead. As a matter of fact, sometimes when you left the temple, they'd just go ahead and have a funeral for you. And your mate could, was free, totally free to marry somebody else if they wanted to because as far as the temple was concerned, you were dead. So they, they looked down their nose at them and they treated them very roughly. Well, over a period of time, what began to happen was that some of these Jewish believers that were now Christians would get lonely for their old life. They would, they would miss some of the people down at the temple. They would... They would, they would remember some of the ceremonies and customs, and you know they were very, uh, very impactful for you. And they would say, you know, I miss that. I, I, I miss the old church, and I miss some of those things that we used to do. And so they would begin to drift back toward Judaism. And so the writer of Hebrews comes along and says, whoa, wait a minute, guys. Hey, stop, whoa, whoa, wait, right there. There's no reason for a Christian to go back to Judaism because Christ is God's son and he is the greatest. And why would we leave him to go back to something that was intended just to lead us to him? In other words, why leave the greater to go back to the lesser? And so the whole book of Hebrews is an argument, a list of arguments as to why a Christian should never consider going back to Judaism and, and, and why Christ is the greatest of all. The book, you, matter of fact, you could write above the title of the book, you could write the better book because that's what it is, the better book. And in that book, the writer of Hebrews says Jesus is better than anything. Jesus is better than angels. Jesus is better than Moses. Jesus is better than the high priest. Jesus has a better covenant than the old covenant. You know, Jesus is the true temple that comes down from heaven of which the old temple was just a shadow of what would come. And the way of faith is far better than any of the works of the, of the old religions of life. And so the book was written to say, stop moving toward Judaism. See, the problem with these Hebrews is they were drifting toward Judaism, dr dr drifting back into it. Now, you and I don't have any trouble drifting toward Judaism. Our trouble is that we drift toward sin. So although it's a, different, it's a different arrival, it's the same principle, and it is about, about how, to, how to stop yourself from drifting into things that, that God has already brought you out of. And so he begins in the first verse of chapter 2 by saying, since all this is true, now, let me stop one second. I, I may, maybe I need to tell you what chapter one is about. Chapter one in the book of Hebrews, it begins with a really poetic line, and I know you Bible students will remember it. It says, God, who in sundry times and in divers manners has spoken to us through the prophets, but he has in these last days spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom all of the world was created. And he is God's son, and he is far better than angels. So in chapter 1, uh, the writer begins to say, Jesus is better than angels. Now, I know that if we could hang out with angels, boy, we would probably like it. Uh, I mean, to hang with angels would be cool, right? You've heard some stories of angels, and you probably thought to yourself, man, those angels, whoo, boy, I'd like to be... Well, according to the book of Hebrews chapter 1 that we're just talking about, that's where it says that the angels have been, have been appointed to be ministers to the heirs of salvation, which is us. This is where we get the concept of a, of a, of a guardian angel from, right out of the first chapter of Hebrews. Because the writer of Hebrews is saying, look... Uh, and angels are awesome. Angels are great. Angels have been give, given tremendous responsibility. And they do tremendously great things. And they have been created by God. And they just do awesome stuff. But they're not the Son. And Jesus is the Son. And so Jesus is better than angels because although they're great servants, they're just servants. They're not Son. 
And so now in verse, first verse of chapter two, he says, all right, since all this is true, everything we've been talking about is true, we ought to pay much closer attention to the truth. Everybody say, pay much closer attention. Pay much closer attention. All right, since all this is true, we ought to pay much closer attention to the truths that we have heard, lest in any way we drift past them and slip away. For if the message given through angels, and the little brackets there to tell you that that's talking about the law that was given to Moses. For if the message that was given through angels was authentic and proved sure, and every violation and disobedient received a just and adequate penalty, what happened if you disobeyed the law that was given to Moses? Well, you died under the hand of two or three witnesses. What happened if you didn't follow the sacrifices? Well, you were put out of the camp and you died because you'd never make it out there by yourself. So if the law that was given by these angels that are lower than Jesus is, if that law has such terrible consequences and penalties that proved to be true and authentic, in other words, they obeyed them and, the, and, and they practiced that. And if you disobeyed, you suffered the consequences. Verse 3, how shall we escape if we refuse to pay attention to such a great salvation as is now offered to us, letting it drift past us forever? For it was declared at first by the Lord himself, and it proved to be real and genuine by those who personally heard him speak. And the next verse said, and God proved it by many signs and miracles and by the working of the power of the Holy Spirit. So do you see what, what Hebrews is saying here? It is saying, if we're not going to drift, if we're not going to drift past this great salvation that we've been offered, then we're going to have to pay much closer attention to the things that have been spoken to us because, I mean, if, if you died under the hands of two or three witnesses because you disobeyed the law that was given to, to, to Moses by angels, just imagine how seriously God takes it when we are disobedient to the words that were actually spoken by God's Son. And so here's the principle. The principle is, in order not to drift, we must pay attention. If you do, then you won't drift. And if you don't, then you will drift. It's like uh, in a few weeks from now, and I hate to even bring it up because I know it's kind of sad uh, for the kids, probably not for you that are in here, but... It's probably, hallelujah, glory to God. The kids are going to start back to school in a few weeks. And, and when they get back to class, it's like God, this is like God's up in heaven and he's looking down at us and, and, he, and he's doing what those teachers are going to have to do to some of those kids when they get back in class, when they're sitting there teaching a lesson and the, and, and the, and the child is looking out the window. Child's looking out the window. The teacher, what does the teacher do? Now, you know what they used to do with us? And I know you hear these old war stories. What they used to do with us is, man, they'd come back there. You'd be looking out that window. They wouldn't even say a word to you. They'd have a yardstick in their hand like that. And they'd come back there, and you'd be looking out that window, and you'd be, you know, maybe your hands be up on the desk, and all of a sudden, bah, bah, bah. <laughs> pay attention. Now, why did they have to do that? Because if we're not paying attention, then we're missing what it is that is being offered to us. And so God, like these teachers, are saying, hey, if you, if you, if you want to stop drifting, if you don't want to drift in life, then you're going to have to pay attention. Now, why is this true? It's because, uh, well, I think in your notes I called it uh, a focus phenomenon. It's, it's just, it's just a, a, a fact about humanity. And that is uh, what we focus on determines our direction. Now, I don't want to sound too philosophical, but, but let, me, well, let me just put this up because you're going to need all these words. It, what we focus on determines our direction. This is what your wife, guys, points out every time you're driving. You know, you, you're driving and, and all of a sudden, you know, you, you, begin to, you begin to move toward the center or the side or, you know, you, yeah, you, yeah, you, 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 
you're driving and, and all of a sudden, you know, you're getting a little close or a little far, to, you know, and you're moving wrong. And, 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 and what's happening? Well, because your focus is on something else, your automobile is beginning to drift. I mean, you see it all the time, especially with young drivers. How many of you have tried to train somebody how to drive an automobile? You seen that? Yeah, you have? Well, you get them out here on the interstate. Do you ever have enough courage to get them out here on the interstate? Don't do it until they can really drive. <laughs> it's dangerous out there. But you get up against that concrete wall barrier that's in the middle, and if you happen to get against that and pin, and then you got like an 18-wheeler in this lane and another 18-wheeler in that lane, and you got some traffic in front of you and behind you, it's really easy if you're not careful going down that center lane with the concrete wall there to feel real anxious about that and you begin looking at that wall. And you say, man, I don't want to hit that thing. I don't want to shoot, man. I don't want... And then, and you see what's happening? I, I'm, I'm moving toward what I'm looking at. I've seen people try to dodge things on the highway. This is just, this is just a, this is a free thing for you, all right? <laughs> Uh, I've seen people try to dodge things on the highway. You know, it'd be, be a box out in the, in the middle of it or something on the road that you could see. And they'll just about invariably run right straight over it every time. You know why? Because when they see it, they look at it, and, they, and, and wherever they're looking, that's where they're going. Because it's our focus that determines our direction. If you don't want to hit it, look some other place. Don't look right at it. If you're running off the road, you're going right toward a telephone pole and you can't have any control over the vehicle, quit looking at the pole. You're going to center it right in the center. Look to the right or the left and you'll go where you look because we humans, we just drift toward what we focus on. Our direction is determined by what we focus on. Now, that's a very tiny thing, right? I mean, it's, it's just really unnoticeable almost. It's just a little movement of your eye. Well, how does drifting start? Drifting starts with a very little thing like that. Very, very minute things like the things that you think about. You begin to think about some little variations and, well, I know that that's really not what I should be doing, but, you know, I, I, I don't really see any big problem with it. Uh, uh, I, you know, really, uh, my Christian life is just a really big relationship with God. And as long as I keep the big picture, the big picture, you know, if I kind of fall off a little on this side or fall off a little, I mean, it's not really, it's, it's not so, is, are those little things really that important in life? Somehow as if God's only interested in your spiritual batting average, you know, I mean, no, no, they are important in life. Because drifting starts with thoughts that begin to influence our life to travel in a certain direction. And once our life begins moving in that direction, it's, it's moving away from where God has intended it to move. And it's the little things that start it moving that way. Just a little... I don't need to be at church every time the door is open, do I? I mean, I can miss sometimes. You know, and it just little, little pecks away, and you get to moving in a direction. Now, here's what happens when you get moving in a direction. When you get headed in a direction, you begin to desire what is ahead in that direction. Whatever that direction takes you in, you begin to desire what that direction feeds you in life. Well, I got far more time if I don't waste my time at church every Sunday. I can go out fishing, hunting, swimming, boating, whatever it is I want to do. I, you know, in other words, I begin to be changed in my desires by the direction that I begin to move in. So now I've gone from something that I allowed to enter my, my thinking and I didn't combat it and I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't fight against it. I just yielded to it and I began to move toward what I began to think. And then as I began to move toward what I began to think, now my desires have, have become more toward the direction I'm going than where I should be. And then my desires end up motivating me. I am motivated. You are motivated by your desires 
I had, Tanya and I uh, were, were fooling with Jax this past, you know, he's three years old. And we were fooling with him, what was it, Friday, I think. And, and he's got this propensity. I, I don't know, maybe some of you that have little tiny ones are, are around them. Maybe the same thing is true, but, but, but uh, they have, uh, they've, they've inter- they started entertaining him, I guess is the best word, with, uh, with a cell phone and punching up some of these little kitty videos and letting him sit there and watch it. And when he would get all upset and stuff, and then he'd just, I mean, he'd just, boom, he just blew right to it. I mean, just immediately like, and just stop crying. I mean, he could be in a throwing fit and you just put that thing in front of him and just be like, oh, oh. Well, now he's three years old and he can navigate this thing. Now, I don't know how he can navigate because he can't even read. I'm, I'm sitting there going, how do you know, how can you get to these elaborate places and you can't even read? You don't even, but he knows where he's going and he goes there and he rolls that little thumb and all. And, and, and so now he's developed a real, a real desire for this phone. And you can put little cartoons on the TV, same thing that's on the phone. You can put it on the TV. He, he's not interested. He wants that phone. And if you call somebody, by the way, if you happen to call Tanya, because she's usually the one whose phone he has, and it just rings and goes straight to voicemail, I'm going to tell you what he did. He just he clicked it off. <laughs> he is the quickest thing you've ever seen in your life. I'm serious. You won't even hear it. It'll go, and he's got it. It's, it's, <laughs> you won't ever know anybody called or anything. And so, and so I looked at him the other day, and and he was, you know, in the middle of complaining about the fact that the TV was on some, you know, uh, PJ mask or whatever the things they watch nowadays. And, and that, but he wanted that phone. And I looked at Tanya, I said, what is it about that phone? That, what do you think it is about that phone? Because no matter what, he wants that phone. You know what's happened? That phone does something for him. Now, I don't know if it's physical or emotional or what it is, but that phone does something for him that nothing else will do. And he wants that phone because it makes him feel good. He is motivated because of his desire to feel good. Now, listen, in case you don't know it, we humans are motivated by our desire to feel good. That is our driver. That's what drugs is about. That's what alcohol is about. That's what relationships are about. That's what all of us about is, my, is our desire to feel good. So what I'm saying to you is with, with just a simple little change of thought, we start heading in a direction. That direction gives us a desire. Our desires, what we desire begins to motivate us. And whatever motivates us, that's what we do. So not to over-dramatize this, but just notice we have moved from a a thought to an attitude to a lifestyle simply by not paying attention to what we focus on. I can't tell you how many families and how many husbands and wives and others I've talked to in my many years of ministry whose lives are falling apart. I'm telling you they are. They're they're having terrible trouble with their children. Their children are rebelling. Their children are failing. Their children are... It's just terrible things that are happening in their family with their children. Their marriage is falling apart. They don't have a real relationship with each other anymore, and it's just, you know, two ships passing in the night. Finances... Finances, oh my Lord, it's a catastrophe. It's a train wreck. It's like how in the world could an adult human being be as ignorant as you seemingly are about finances? Do you know that if your output surpasses your input, your upkeep is going to be your downfall? Do you know that? You can't, in other words, you can't spend more than you make. Not forever. <laughs> Some of you are trying. I know you are. But you can't do it. I'm going to tell you it's going to be a disaster. And here's, here's my point. I'll ask them, 
When did this start? Your children are like a pack of wild Comanche Indians that nobody can control, and the school has basically suspended them so many times they're not, almost not going to let them come back to school anymore. Uh, when did that start? And they'll, and they'll say, yesterday. I got a note yesterday from the school. No, it didn't start yesterday. It started about five years ago when you decided that your children could run your family better than you could. And when you let them decide what church you go to and what you do in life, and you let them decide when you go, they wake up the poor little thing, well, we won't go today. That's when that started. And that's how drifting always starts. It starts with these tiny little things that don't seem to have any significance at the time but begin to move us in a direction that is away from God, and then we lose focus, and we just throw the reins up and let the wild horses run, as if we somehow now can't control anything to do with our life, and then about five years later, when we wash up on some desert island, and, and, and we're bleached and sunburned and shipwrecked and tattered and torn, and we look around going, what happened? Well, what happened is you drifted because you weren't paying attention. You have to pay attention. Hebrews says if you, pay, if you pay attention, you won't drift. If you don't pay attention, you will drift. Now, then how can we, what can we do that, that can help us what can be a tool? How can we apply? What, what, when, we say, when we say pay attention, what, what does that mean? How do I do that? What, are there any strategies that I could have that would help me pay attention? I mean, you say it's, and it is. So how are we going to do it? All right, let me give you first one. Number one, I'm going to give you three of these, by the way. The first one is establish some reference points in your life. The reason you need some reference points is because you need to know where you are. One of the problems we have with drifting is we don't even know where we are. It's like we look up and all of a sudden there's no reference to say, man, you're a long way from where you started because you didn't establish any reference points before you got in. Now listen, we need reference points in every aspect of our life. The music you listen to, the TV shows you watch, the movies you go to, what you allow to come into your house, what kind of language you, you tolerate. I mean, we need reference points on all of that kind of stuff. But I'm not going to give you all that, but I will give you three when, when I finish this point in just a second that I think are really important and show you what I mean about reference points. Uh, back about 30 years ago now, it's been about 30 years, you guys know I love to listen to preaching. It's a hobby of mine. I love it. I, I like louder ones, and I like soft ones, I like wild ones, and I like tame ones, and I like all kind of preaching. It's just, I just love to hear it. Well, Andy Stanley is Charles Stanley's son, and many of you know Charles Stanley because he's been around, uh, I think, since Jesus was crucified almost. Um, <laughs> Charles has been there, and he's been teaching on TV that whole time. Well, he has a son named Andy, and Andy's a pastor, great pastor, big church, all that kind of stuff. Well, Andy shared a story about when he was growing up. He said, when we were growing up, he said, um, we didn't have a lot of money. And so every year we took our vacation down in Florida. We just left Atlanta and went down to Florida on the beach. And he said, we, most of the time we went to Naples because Naples at that time, this shows you how long ago it was, they didn't have any ordinance where you couldn't just pull right out on the beach. So you, if you had a camper, you could just pull your little camper right out there on the beach and set up your little campfire and a little place and have your place where you're going to spend your few days of vacation. And so Andy said that when they pulled out on the beach, he said they, they parked a camper, and he said then their dad began to look around at all these uh, trees, these palm trees, and they had some coconuts that had fallen. And he said what he did was he went and gathered up the coconuts, and he took them, and he started walking off some steps to measure and he, and he walked a certain distance from the camper, and he, put, he started piling these coconuts up like this. And then he looked at his children, and he said, now, he said, what this is, is he said, when you get out in that water out there, there's going to be an undertow. There's going to be a current that's going to pull you. 
And you're not going to be able to know because you're not going to be paying attention. And it's going to be so subtle and usually so slow that you're not going to know where you are. But what I want you to do is look at this trailer and look at these coconuts. And when you're out there in that water, if at any time you look up and you are not between the trailer and the coconuts, then you get out of the water and come back down and get in between the trailer and the coconuts. Now, just a, a little added point here. You, you can't stay in the water. I mean, you can, you can, but it's really hard to walk against the toe, right? So it, it makes much more sense to come out of the water. Just, just like think of the water as the world. Think of the water as sin, and it's pulling you away, pulling you away. You can't just try to stay in your sin and come back up there. It, it's, it's too hard to push against the toe. Come on out of it. Walk up the beach. Get between the trailer and the coconuts. So the whole point of the thing, though, is they knew where they were because Dad was wise enough to establish some reference points so that when they looked up and, and they didn't know where they were, they could see, man, we are not between the trailer and the coconuts, and we could run and get back because Dad was wise enough to set up some points so they could tell where they were. The first thing about drifting is, if you're going to pay attention, you have to have some way to know whether you're drifting or not. So you have to establish some some reference points at your life, in your life. Am, is my life between the trailers and the coconut? And one that we all have dealings with and we all could identify with would be like physical lust. Physical lust, you know, I mean, we're human beings. We're temptable. We, we have issues, you know, I mean, we're motivated by looks and smell and sight and all that kind of stuff. Well, what would be some coconuts that I could pile out here? Well, it would be like this. It like when you find yourself adjusting yourself to so, so that you could be seen by someone else, like your desk in the office, you move it about six inches because when he comes through that door, he can see you if you're sitting right there and you can make a little eye contact and have a little smile. Hey, give me a that, that's not between the trailer and the coconuts. If, if, if you start finding yourself wearing a perfume or a cologne because someone beside your mate has mentioned to you that that stuff just smells wonderful, that's not between the trailer and the coconuts. <laughs> I mean, when you find yourself being preoccupied by thoughts of, well, I wonder what they're doing, and I wonder what they think. But, and you become preoccupied with what somebody that's not your mate is thinking. Then, then that's not between the trailer and the coconuts. you got to get out. Those are red flags. You say, well, pastor, that's not a big problem. I know it's not. That's the whole point of the thing. The whole point is to stop it before it gets to be a problem. To set something up to recognize it before it gets out of hand, before it gets too big to stop, so that you can see where you are and you can get out and come back and get between the trailer and the coconuts. All right, here's the second one. Establish an accountability relationship with another Christian. Now, this is... This is such a simple uh, point, but it is so vital. This is so vital. What this is saying to, you, to us is that many people, especially Christians, have, develop an attitude when we come to Christ that we are Christians, that we, we pray, we read our Bible, we know what the Lord says, and we don't need anybody to be meddling in our business. It's kind of like that. I, I don't know where this came from, but I, I remember an old song that says, uh, let's see, me and Jesus got our own thing going. Yeah, me and Jesus, we got it all worked out. Me and Jesus, we got our own thing going. We don't need anybody to tell us what it's all about. May I say to you, that is exactly wrong. <laughs> the Lord does not intend for us to be lone rangers. 
If you read the New Testament, you will find in almost every book, I would just dogmatically say it, but, but, but I don't want to be that dogmatic, but it, it'd be very hard to find one of the books of the New Testament that doesn't tell you that we all need each other. That doesn't say we're a body. We're part of a body. Some of us are eyes, some are ears, some are mouth, some are hands, some are elbows, some are feet, some are big toes. I mean, you know, that we're all part of the body of Christ and that we all need each other. We need each other to do what we do so that the body's not sick and it functions right and everybody's blessed and, and, and the kingdom of God moves forth in this world. So we need each other. And, and an accountability with another Christian means that I find someone who is skilled in the area of my weakness. Now, I'm not just talking about finding anybody because if they're not skilled in the area of your weakness, you're going to put the buffalo on them and they're never going to even know it. You got to find somebody that's been where you are and is crafty like you are and will pay attention to you and they know what it means when you say certain things and look certain ways and when you do certain things, they know what's going on. You need to get them that are skilled in that and then you need to give them permission to get in your business. You need to say, look, I ha I'm weak in this. Can you help me with this? If you see me going, drifting, tell me. And then when they tell you, don't fuss at them. Don't argue with them. Don't get your little feelings hurt because somebody, somebody said something to me about yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you ask them to. Hey, how is your prayer life? We used to call it a quiet time. How's your quiet time? Oh, real quiet. <laughs> hey, you missed church last week. Where were you? None of your business. It is my business. You asked me to ask you about this. Where were you? What were you doing? What's more important than church? Do you realize how ugly you were to that person? Do you realize how what you said to them hurt their feelings and there was no reason for you to say that? Do you know how your face looked and how your voice sounded when you said that to them? You need to go apologize. Accountability. Because You know why? Because there are two reasons. Number one, we never see ourselves the way we really are. And I'll guarantee you, you don't. And if your mate will start tape, phone, digital, whatever, recording you on your cell phone when you get on some of that stuff you get on uh, and then show you when you settle down, you'll get the sense to see you don't see yourself the way you really are. And number two, we are expert rationalizers. Even if we do see ourselves the way we really are, we can explain it away. Well, I, I was just tired. I, I, didn't, uh, I didn't know what I was saying. You know, I was just angry at this, whatever it might have been. And so we need accountability people in our life, not because we're weak, but because we're humans. And humans have these frailties about ourselves. So if I'm not going to drift, I'm going to have to pay attention. If I'm going to pay attention, I need some reference points. And I need somebody in my life that sees me for who I really am and knows me. And I've given permission to say something to me about this so that I can keep going in the right direction. And then number three, establish the discipline of praying for discernment and courage. You don't have to pray for this because... These, I mean, discernment just means <clears throat> that I'm going to see something before it happens. I put a little prayer in your notes that you could just pray. It's about two sentences, isn't it? It's like, you know, it's like, Lord, give me the ability to uh, discern, to see trouble coming a mile away and the courage to deal with it no matter what it costs. That's a simple little prayer, right? Lord, give me the, give me the discernment to see trouble coming a mile away. Can I see trouble coming before it gets there? The Holy Spirit can give me uh, wisdom and knowledge and, and help and insight and, uh, and, and, and my accountability partner can tell me things that they see coming and, you know, and, and I can have the ability to, to maybe not completely know, but at least to anticipate the fact that, there's, that that right there is going to be a real problem. And then I've got to have enough courage 
once I recognize it, to do something about it. I mean, just because I see it doesn't mean that it's going away. It means I've got to have enough courage to do something to, to stop the forward momentum of whatever it is that's moving at me in a destructive way. God's given me a responsibility as a parent for my children. You know why they need parents? Because there's dangerous stuff that happens in their life. Terrible things are happening. And it's getting worse and worse every day. And we just, many times, like ostrich, stick our head in the sand and pretend stuff doesn't exist and just let them do whatever they want to because, oh, they're our kids and we don't want them to be upset. That's because you want to be a friend. They don't need a friend. They got plenty of friends. They need a parent is what they need. I mean, don't, don't, don't send them in there to a room that's got a computer in it that goes straight to the internet with no, with no blockages and no filters whatsoever. I can tell you what they're going to be doing. They're going to be on pornography in less than five seconds. Or some molester or some chat room somewhere where somebody's pretending to be their friend and arranging some kind of meeting that's going to happen when you don't know where it is. And then you're going to look up one day and they're going to be gone and you're going to say, what happened? Well, what happened was you didn't pay attention. And you knew that was going to be a problem. There's no parent in this room that knows that's not a problem. But you stuck your head in the sand because you don't have enough courage to deal with it. And you let them do whatever they want to and it ends up being a disaster for everybody involved and their lives too. Now, all right, I'm, I'm going to get off of that because I, I got started getting mean now. But okay. I'm not really talking to you personally. I'm talking to everybody. So anyway, anyway, let me stop. Let me just say this to you. All right. No person sitting in this building right now at this moment can do everything you need to do about what we're talking about. You can't do it all right here because it just doesn't happen that quick in that way. But what we can do right now is make a commitment to it. You know, every, every valuable thing in our life begins with a commitment. I'm, I, I'm committing myself to this. I'm, uh, with your mate, with your family, with your life, with your finances, with your, with your, with your spiritual life, with everything. I, I'm, I'm beginning with this commitment right here. And so we begin with the commitment and we can make a commitment here today. Although we can't do everything we need to do, we can make a commitment to do what we need to do. Are you drifting? I mean, don't raise your hand. I don't want to know. Are you drifting? I mean, are, 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 are you seeing yourself with a tendency to move that way? I mean, you may not be way out here somewhere, but you, you kind of have begun to you know, lean that way and so forth. Do you want to, do you want to stop that? You want, to, you, want to, you want to cure that before it ends up being a destructive tool in your life? Before catastrophe happens and then you come running back and saying, oh, I should have done. No. You can, you can foresee these things. And this is what God intends. You know, when we talk about, when we talk about living on the mountaintop and, and, and not going from the mountaintop to the valley, the mountaintop, valley, mountaintop, and living life like a yo-yo, this is what we're talking about. We're talking about using the wisdom that God has given you and using the tools and the instructors and the people and the passions of the kingdom of God to help your life stabilize so that you can live a life that God intended for you to live so that you could be happy in life. You know, my motive is I want you to be happy in life. I don't want you to have to suffer these miserable, terrible things. I want us to enjoy life and enjoy each other like God intended for us to. But it, but, but it calls for some decisions and some choices and some responsibilities. And it does every time. So I'm